So as I mentioned earlier, there is this, uh, there's a short link here, bit.ly slash blendscaler that will give you access to all of the slides today, including links to resources for when you go home and two months later when you're pulling scalar back out of the dusty technological box and don't remember what we did today. Um, this will hopefully get you, um, remind you to, to where you, to, you can go to sort of keep working um, with scalar. So to start out talking a little bit about what scalar maybe is and what it's good for, maybe what it's not good for, um, it's uh, coming out of USC. Uh, this is from their website. They say it's a free, open source authoring and publishing platform that enables users to assemble media from multiple sources and juxtapose them with their own writing in a variety of ways with minimal technical expertise required. In some ways, this could describe like a lot of different platforms, right? Um, but what's important is that it's coming out of the Alliance for Network Visual Culture, and the idea behind it was um, it's growing out of the Vectors Project, if anyone's in media studies and is familiar with that. But the idea was for especially people in um, visual studies and in film um, to have a better platform for um, bringing their scholarship and the objects of their scholarship closer together, right? So obviously you can't include film with print books. So this is a way of trying to sort of um, bring those things together. It's evolved to be actually much more, and I would say um, sort of like Omeka, where the uh, original intent wasn't necessarily for the classroom, it's actually had a big uptake in the classroom in ways that I think they maybe um, weren't expecting. Uh, but maybe some of the, the sort of number one uses of it, I would say, um, it started as a sort of supplement to a book project, right? So the, all the images that you can't afford to put in color in your books, right, the videos, um, it's a great site for sort of uh, creating visual interest around around those particular objects, um, and for uh, they have some nice annotation capabilities for both uh, video and um, and images that uh, can really help sort of zoom into interesting parts of uh, those materials, which we'll talk about a little bit more today. Uh, people have used it to just sort of publish uh, born digital open access books and articles. Uh, so starting with Scalar rather than starting with the, the print monograph. Um, so they sort of were, some people are imagining their projects already in this sort of digital realm and working with, again, a lot of um, images. Uh, students have been using it to write media-rich essays. Uh, there's been dissertations that have been completed in Scalar. Um, and uh, more recently, some people are using it for um, open educational materials. So they're, um, one of the examples we're going to look at today is a textbook for a writing class that somebody um, has actually created. So in thinking about um, how many use or support Omeka in your institutions? Okay, so Omeka is sort of the digital archiving, digital exhibition platform that came out of Center History New Media um, at George Mason. Uh, how about WordPress? Yeah, okay, great, okay. Um, and then how many Scalar again, just so I can see? Okay, great, yeah. So I mean, Scalar is newer, it's the new kid on the block, right, compared to some of those other ones. But um, what I would say is, uh, in thinking about those three different platforms, which I would say are kind of the closest together, or the ones that are often first supported um, by our different programs and institutions, um, you know, Omeka I think is still the place of what's uh, most important is the the objects themselves and the metadata. So if you're really thinking about um, a digital archive or digital exhibit, um, I think Omeka is still the right place to sort of be doing that in. Um, Omeka also has more granular permissions, so it's great for collaborative work and for student work, so you can tell students that they can only work with already published materials and they can't delete anything on the site, or that they can um, create their own exhibits but not be able to touch other people's, and there's, there's some sort of, there's granular permissions there. Scalar, not so much. So it's basically author or commenter, that's it. And those mean exactly what you would think they mean. So the authors can delete the whole book if they would like and so on. So um, so I think they're still really thinking about, um, uh, again, the sort of pedagogical uses that maybe weren't in the, the four instances that weren't built into the platform in the first place. Um, and WordPress, you know, uh, I don't know. You all sort of have ideas about when that would probably be most useful. Um, if, it's, if what they need is just a website about their book, right, or is a, um, something that's more presentation of materials, I would say WordPress is still probably one of your best choices. Um, or, of course, if it's a blog, right, of course, blog, and that's important. Um, Scalar, as you'll see, is sort of better for the, the um, arguments that are made with 
uh, again, the visual elements. So sort of when those things are important together, um, and hopefully you'll be able to see it in more detail, uh, again, where scalar is sort of the best. Coming soon, this is something that is uh, sort of coming down the pike a little bit. So um, I'm actually working here with my colleagues in Special Collections, and we're doing some special layouts for Scalar um, that are supposed to be, they'll be a little bit better for digital exhibitions, or um, really, if I'm being honest, it's more digital presentations of analog exhibitions. So things like checklists, if you work with curators, um, and so on. So there'll be some other kinds of layouts that will be available. June 1st, actually, so very, very soon. So let's look at a couple of examples. This one is one of the uh, earliest uh, Scalar 2. If you if you looked at Scalar a few years ago and you haven't looked at it again, it looks very, very different. Um, and you'll be able to tell. Um, uh, if someone tells you it's a Scalar site and it doesn't look like this, you'll know it's Scalar 1. It was something, it definitely looks like, you know, 1998 or something, right, 2005. It's an archive of, I don't know, thousands of um, images, it kind of like looks like a book cover kind of layout, right? It's very visually um, impactful. Um, it's a different thing than like the, how you might encounter like a basic WordPress site, right? It has a kind of different, different feel than that. Um, I'm just going to show you a few things here. So uh, there's sort of a standard introduction. Um, Scalar has. Um, multiple ways of navigating information, which we'll talk about a little bit later. One of them is through paths that you can create. There's sort of multiple linear ways through your materials. Um, it has some visualization capabilities. This is just, again, to just give you a little bit of a sense of what it looks like. And this is pretty much out of the box. There's no special customization that's happening here. Um, it, it looks that good, which is exciting. Okay. The other one I actually wanted to show you is um, a book by Vimala Asapali, and it is uh, called, what's it, Writing with Substance, I believe? Yes. Oh, we have some familiar, people are familiar with this book? No. No, we haven't heard of it. Confirming that I can read. I like it. I like it. Um, so this is a, a textbook that uh, she created for first year writing. Um, with some materials in here, there's also a lot of cats, which is kind of fun, um, and an explanation of why cats are fun on the internet. Um, but this is something that, that she uses over and over again. Um, so uh, in her first year of writing classes that she tweaks with each, each time she teaches it, um, you know, lots of faculty have been doing this in lots of different platforms for many, many years. Um, and so this is one sort of possibility. Um, if there are, if you use a lot of videos in your class that are hosted elsewhere on the web, this could be a good platform for that. Um, Scalar, I should say, is also, it's not really great for, it's not meant to be a place to store digital assets like images and videos. Um, they have an upload limit that's pretty small for like videos. Um, it's, it's really, uh, what's exciting about it actually is that it's taking advantage of uh, linking capabilities, so it's kind of getting around copyright issues by, for one thing, not actually hosting those videos and those images, it's just embedding them. So whenever somebody goes to that page, it will go back to YouTube or go back to wherever that, that video is hosted and pull it up for your students to watch within, within Scalar. Um, the obvious disadvantage of that, right, is that there's a takedown notice that happens on YouTube for that Seinfeld clip, which is going to happen within like 24 hours. Um, that, it's, that it's no longer available in the Scalar site either. But again, it's sort of a clever way of, of um, thinking, using sort of um, using the web to, uh, uh, yeah, sort of practice some copy right, uh, copy left kind of philosophies. Right. Okay. Um, so again, a good way to sort of collect some of these materials. All right. So as I was starting to gesture here, what's a little different about Scalar is it has what's called a flat ontology. So this is different than something like WordPress where you have like the objects that build WordPress are your pages and your posts, right? And posts um, have to be embedded on a page and there's a kind of hierarchy. You can't really embed a post in a post sort of, um, that's just not how WordPress is meant to, meant to work. So in Scalar, everything has equal weight. So anything can be related to anything else. So that means, um, you can tag an image 
with another image. You can connect um, a page to a video to an annotation. You can annotate uh, a tag with a video, right? You can do all of these sorts of, of um, things. You can build these sort of really complex relationships. Um, and I think this is, again, where a lot of the power uh, of Scalar is, a lot of what's exciting. I think it's also one of the hardest things to, to think about how to really take advantage of, to sort of imagine um, the possibilities there. But um, I've seen a few projects that are starting to do this that I think are exciting. Um, so again, uh, a page can contain all these materials, um, like you would expect like on a standard web page. Um, but the relationship that it's creating kind of behind the scenes uh, is, is much more um, flexible than what you're getting with like a WordPress database or something. So if you have never signed up with Scalar before, um, you go to scalar.usc.edu slash scalar, and uh, there should be a button there to sign up. If you've already signed up with Scalar a long time ago, and you don't remember like, where that was, if you just go to scalar.usc.edu, there's a button there that says log in or sign in or something like that. We're going to go ahead and uh, move forward. So the first thing we're going to do is um, add some content uh, to Scalar. I will just point out, so again, in the slides, uh, they have uh, some decent documentation at Scalar that they're, they're working on updating all the time. Um, so that, that, again, if you go home later and don't remember how you did something, you can check these links. Um, and that's their documentation about how to actually do some of the steps that we're about to do. So I'm actually going to go ahead and make sure I'm logged into Scalar. Close these guys. And how many of you uh, just signed up for Scalar for the first time? That's most people, right? Okay. So yours will look slightly different than mine. Um, what you're seeing, does it ask you to create a book right away? Or do you have a, like an index page? Index page and a dashboard. And a dashboard. Okay, great. Um, so, something like this with a lot less, lot less clutter, probably. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to start by going to the dashboard, and that's in the, the top right. Um, one of the things that's different about Scalar 2 is that you can do a lot of things in the public side of the site. You actually don't have to come to this dashboard very much. So that's actually nice for working with students sometimes, is that they can do a lot of the authoring from the front sort of public view of the site, um, and they don't have to worry about what's back here in the dashboard. Um, so select uh, the far left tab, my account. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. But you, you should have it in front of you as well, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so under my account, if you scroll down, um, there should be an option to create a new book. So I'm just going to call mine. You can change this later if you don't like the title of it. Uh, learning at Rinbar. And then, of course, there's the test about whether or not you're a robot. And I actually had this break on me during a workshop, and we went through like 30 of these things, and it would not accept it. So we'll see what's going to happen. Street numbers. All right. Oh, we're helping the robots. <laughs> Learn all about us. All right. Okay. Has everyone been able to do that? You might have to read robots faster than, than I was able to. Um, you'll see actually right below it as well, there's this drop down um, where it says not a duplicate of another book. Uh, this is an option where you could duplicate another book sort of in its entirety. So if you are teaching a class over and over again, you might have a standard one. That you just duplicate and then tweak a little bit each time you teach it. That could be one option. Um, we're going to be using this for our special collections, for our student uh, curated exhibitions. So we're going to have a kind of standard thing that has our special collections logo and all of that information, um, like our Bryn Mawr logo, and they'll duplicate it and then add the different uh, images and their own text uh, themselves. So it's like a template. Yeah, it's, it is kind of like a template. And you can also, you can decide to make yours public to the world as well. Um, so I will say this uh, Scalar instance that we're, we're looking we're working with today is housed at USC. If you have Scalar installed at your own institution, um, when you go to duplicate a book, you're only going to be able to duplicate books that are at your own institution, um, so for better or worse, right? So right now we have like the universe 
is open to us, because these are all the people who've created Scalar books who have said, yes, you can duplicate my book. Yeah. So I can use Scalar hosted at USC. Yes. Or have my own instance. Yes, yes. So you'd have to spin it up yourself. Um, they have a GitHub page where you can okay. download it with instructions on how to install it. Also, if you use um, like Reclaim Hosting or a domain of one's own at your home institutions, um, they have it available through the cPanel to install. Um, I think there, there are like a few updates behind, but they were supposed to have fixed it like last week, but I haven't checked in. Um, but it's not like, it's still totally usable. They're just, yeah. Is there a benefit or downside to doing one or the other? Yeah, I would say, so um, in Scalar's always free. It's, there's no freemium even. It's just, it's just free on Scalar, so you don't pay more to get more storage. You just, that's all the storage you get at Scalar. So I'd say if you have, if you wanted to use it to actually host materials to keep your images in there, you probably want your own instance. Um, if you wanted it to be, oh no, my robot has expired. I'll never make it again. Um, so if you wanted to um, uh, have, again, like just have a smaller subset of duplicatable books, um, that might be a good reason. For us, uh, if, you know, if you wanted to customize something and be able to control that, um, uh, although Scalar Hosted gives you a lot of options for customizability, I'm going to say this, and then um, you don't ever have to do this, but they give you options to, um, you can write your own JavaScript and CSS at the global level for your book or page level. So there's a lot of options for customizability just with the free hosted Scalar as well. All right, let me try this again. And, okay, cars. And, okay, so I'm just going to create without duplicating another book. We're just going to get a kind of blank slate here. It's working a little bit. Was everyone able to do that successfully? Much faster than I was? Great. Okay, so um, like I said, you can do a lot of things from this dashboard, but it's actually a lot easier to work from the front end. So we're going to click back to book. That's in the top right here. And you can see when we start out, it says great, but your book has no content, so there's there's nothing here. Um, so if you select, oh, this is because my screen is too big. Let me just pull that. There we go. So you should see a toolbar of, with icons in the top right. If you hover over them, they tell you what they mean. So the magnifying glass is to search the site for its content, um, the question mark. Uh, if you select it, it will um, give you some information about Scalar, but it also has a link to the user's guide. So if you forget where that is later, um, I always encourage students, like if they can't think of something, go straight to the user's guide. The user's guide is created in Scalar, so they can also search um, for questions that they have within that documentation. Uh, they have, again, the plus sign to add a new page. Um, what we're actually going to do first is we're going to add, um, add some media elements. So we're going to do the one where it looks like, I, I do have a little bit of an issue with their icon. So what would you think this one means with the arrow and the tray? Download. Download. It means upload. I don't get it. Uh, yeah, this is how you actually add your media to the site. Don't, don't ask me why. Um, but they have, if you hover over it, there's four options. So they have affiliate archives, other archives, local media files, and internet media files. So local media files is uh, just a standard upload. So whatever's on your desktop or your computer that you want to, you know, pictures of your cat, whatever, you can upload them there. Um, the internet media files is like if you've ever done this with Google or some other things. You, if you just have a URL that ends with like .jpg or .png, you can um, add images that way or uh, media that way. The best parts of Scalar are these relationships and bridges that they've built with other institutions. So they have um, kind of formal relationships with Critical Commons, with the Internet Archive, uh, with SHOA, with the Cuban Theater Digital Archive, a few kind of somewhat random, some of these um, organizations. And if I select one of them, let's say I select the Internet Archive, and I'm going to search for Bryn Mawr. You stay within Scalar, and it pulls up a bunch of materials that it has. So this one's not great because it's showing me just text. Oh, here we go. So we've got some plastic surgeon video <laughs> at Bryn Mawr. 
etc. And if you select a couple of things here, um, don't select all, but just select maybe a few from whatever you've searched with. If you select import selected, the blue button, what's great is that it pulls in the metadata. Everything that it knows about those objects, it's pulling it in automatically. So this is great when working with students um, as well. So it knows the title, it knows the description, it has the source URL where it came from, it even has, this is actually more than a lot of um, objects will have, right? But it has the identifier, what type it is, where it came from, all of that information. And if I just click continue, I've selected two objects. So it's going to now then ask me to review the metadata for the second one. Uh, you can update this metadata. And like if you knew Bernar was spelled wrong or something, you can update it. It's only updating it in your scalar book, right? It's not going back to the Internet Archive and updating that. It's only working here, which again is good for, for students, right, to help them think about, about metadata. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that, import those objects. It'll take a little bit, and you should get a green success. Just click the X button to get out of that. Um, and they also have, so they have the sort of formal relationships, and that's where they're going to get like the really good metadata, because they've built these like really good relationships. But they've also taken advantage of APIs, of application programming interfaces, for a number of other more widely used um, uh, places that they don't necessarily have formal relationships with. So the Met is a really great one. Um, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, right? So they, if I go to YouTube, whoops, I can do the same thing. So I could search for Bryn Mawr again. Okay. And I'm gonna take a, we've got our new, our new campaign, our president's campaign video on here. Um, and again, you can see, so the metadata that pulls in is a little bit less, but it tells us it's coming from YouTube, Bryn Mawr College is the one who uploaded it, etc. So it actually pulled that in automatically. So now uh, to uh, use those materials, actually, we're going to uh, do some annotation. So um, one of the uh, sort of tricks of Scalar that I think isn't necessarily uh, laid, well laid out is um, on the top left you have two icons. So one is that sandwich menu thing, which you hover over and it'll give you an index, um, which we're going to look at in just a second. The other one's a navigation. And this is the best thing for when you're just putting in a bunch of content and feeling you don't remember uh, like where you put it, uh, it'll help you find that material, which is, which is really great. But for now, we're going to hover over the sandwich menu and we're going to select index. And this will tell us to get these different tabs with all of the different objects. Uh, and pages and paths. The only thing we have right now, of course, is media. That's the only thing we've created. Um, so I'm going to go into the media tab and I'm going to select one of my objects. Um, so I have a, an image of a fierce looking lady that I pulled off the net. Um, this is Benjamin Simons. So go ahead and uh, just open up one of your images. And you may or may not have noticed but uh, Scalar has now added an additional icon. When you're looking at a media object that is annotatable, it adds a paper clip. I don't know what that has to do with annotation, but uh, if you select it, it'll bring you to the annotation editor. So for images, you can just drag and drop. And unfortunately, it is only a, uh, a rectangle or a square. But I might, uh, you can add annotations directly onto the object. So let's say, um, okay, so this is Natalie Simons. And when you save it, you'll see it shows up right below the image uh, with the title. You can add some more content to it. So if I wanted to describe, uh, or have some more analytical material that the students would be providing or you would be doing. Uh, and you can adjust the X and Y and the width and the height. So if I know, oh, it's not quite, it's maybe a little too high, I can sort of shrink it down, um, move it to the left or right, whatever I need to do there. Scroll down, click Save. And this will be important because I'll show you in a little bit how, what we can actually do with annotations. Is there a way to make your annotations hyperlinked? So that is a really good question. I don't think it gives you. Um, let's just try it. Let's 
The URLs. Yes. Right. Yep. Perfect. That. Uh, and also know. this. It's tiny on the screen to make it there. Okay. So we'll see what happens. I'm guessing not. I'm guessing it's not able to render it, but that might actually be something you could change later on. Well, it hasn't stripped it, so that's interesting. Um, so it's not showing up there. I'm clicking done, so done will bring you back to the image. Hey, look at that. It did work. It hyperlinked it. Cool. So I just wrote just some HTML there to create a hyperlink, and it looks like it accepted it. You learn something every new workshop you run. So that's that's great. They'll let you do it. OK, has everyone been able to create at least one annotation for your image? Cool. Let's do, like, let's do this for uh, videos as well. So we go through some of the same steps. We hover over the sandwich menu and then select index. Under media, you select one of your videos. Uh, I think this is the video. It should give you the annotation paperclip again in the top right, which should take you to an annotation editor. Now this will look a little different because instead of being um, spatial, it's chronological, right? The thing that you're actually annotating is a clip of the clip of the video clip. So um, you don't get to sort of draw on the image. Uh, what you're going to do is if I push play, and I don't know what this is going to sound like, so I'm going to apologize straight away if it's loud. Okay. Actually, not too bad. There's these little plus and minuses in the bottom left. If you select plus, that's where you create a new annotation. And it gives you these time, time bars. You can set when the annotation appears and when it disappears which is really nice. So let's say I'm playing along and, oops, and I decide I'm going to stop right there at that shot for some reason. Um, and I'm going to call this students walking because I'm really creative. Um, and you can add some, again, some content. So this is an example of students walking on campus. Um, and I'm going to save it. Again, make sure you're saving it. Um, and you can add multiple. And they can overlap. They can, um, uh, yeah, they could be sort of for the whole video and so on. And this is really important because when we get to actually create our pages, we can jump directly to an annotation. So if you have a 10-minute video clip in class and you really just want to show them um, this 30 seconds of it or this 10 seconds of it, or you want to talk about this 10 seconds and this 5 seconds and this 30 seconds, you can link to each of those moments. In the time in the video. I mean, um, yeah. Play back your annotation. So once you've saved it, yeah. um, we're going to do that right here under yeah. annotations. Yeah. So once you saved it, you're going to done. There's a, a bar for annotations, and if you select it, it'll jump straight to that five seconds in. It stops when my thing stops. Um, and it's not showing the, the annotation is live right anymore. All right, so this is sort of, again, this is how you're working with media. This is sort of the, the beginning ways you can sort of start to engage with it, start to, um, again, pull in media from different sources, annotate it. Um, but most of the time, you're going to want to do that sort of in the context of a narrative, right? You want to sort of include it on a page. So I'm going to scroll up to the top of my page here. Um, and what would you... This is back to my icons. What would you think would be the one to uh, create a new page? Plus. <laughs> awesome. You guys are great. OK, it is actually the plus. I always want to do the, the, the pencil. I always want to write, but that's the edit one. So we're going to click plus to create a new page. And it'll take just a minute. It's thinking. Um, so, so let's say. Um, I want to call this page Bryn Mawr in the summer. Okay. And here you have the, the standard editor that you would see in any kind of word processing um, software you have. So you can bold things, italicize them. If you want, you can toggle over to the source HTML code, and you can do a lot more in there. Um, let's just take, let's see here. 
I'm not actually going to write it. Okay, so this is... Okay, these blue buttons are where it gets really exciting and important. So this is how you're actually engaging with those materials that you just brought in. So this first one um, is the one that's most commonly used, and that's for um, hyperlinking the material on your page. So in order to use it, you need to have some text that you highlight, and then just like you were creating a hyperlink, you select it, and it says, great, what material do you want to connect here? And I'm going to pull on a video. It gives you some options for where you want this to appear. The different layouts, which you'll see in a minute, also um, determine where and how media appear. Um, and they're pretty flexible, which is exciting. But this means you can have one video that's small right, another one that's large left. Um, you can decide if you want the caption to show just the description or the title and description or nothing at all. Um, and you can decide if you want the annotations to be visible or not. And also what the featured annotation is. So if you had multiple ones, which one do you want to show up as the kind of first one? I'm going to click continue to add that. The other options let you add media sort of in line. So if you don't want it necessarily connected to text, you just want it sort of like in the middle of your page, you can just do that. You can just drop it in. So I could say, I just enter. You can just drop in an armchair randomly, and it will sort of appear in the middle of the page. It will look a lot better than this on your actual page. Um, you can also create notes. Uh, and people use this actually most frequently I've seen as like citations. So we use it to um, provide bibliographic information or, um, yeah, that's usually actually the number one way I've seen it. And then you can, of course, also um, link to other pages within Scalar or pages without outside of Scalar as well. So once you have, again, some materials up there, some links to different media files, if you scroll down, we have another um, set of options down here. The one we're going to really worry about today is the layout one. So right now we just have a basic layout. Um, the, they nicely give you descriptions of what each of these do. So this tells us it freely mixes text and media. Let's just go ahead and leave it as it is and click Save and View. And your materials should appear. It'll take just a second. Um, however you told them to appear. So if you said for them to be on the right or the left, they should be there. If you ask them to include um, annotations or hide annotations, they should show that. If you, yeah, if you select the annotations in a particular video, for instance, again, it's going to take you to that object and to that moment um, in the actual video. Yeah. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. I didn't see how you just inserted the image on the page. I saw how to link it. Yeah, it's the blue button right next to that. So let's all click edit again on this particular page. And so we have the first blue button is to insert it um, as a media link. The second one is to insert it um, in line. So if I go like between my paragraphs or something and I select that second one, I don't have to have anything highlighted. In fact, you shouldn't have anything highlighted. Um, and then you can just insert something straight in as well. So now we, we use the basic uh, media, but let's try a different um, uh, header. So let's try the let's try the media gallery, or whatever you would like. This is this is your choice um, in terms of the layout. And now without having to change any code, any uh, templates, anything, all of my media is now just up here in the gallery on top. So what they've kind of taken out of this, right, or what they've tried to emphasize is, again, the relationship between the text and the image. Um, and you, as sort of an author, have flexibility on how you want to represent those relationships. So they've taken out, you know, you don't have to do, you don't have to know custom CSS, you don't have to change everything in your book to make it all media galleries, right? You can page by page decide how you want that information to appear. So, questions about this? Does that get back there? Yeah. Do you know how accessible this platform is? Yeah. So, the, okay, so in terms of like mobile responsiveness, it's responsive. And we're talking about accessibility. Um, 
So some of the visualizations, which you're not going to have time to get to today, like almost all data visualizations these days, are not accessible, right? So they're, um, but they're not a requirement of the platform at all. Um, so they have um, the ARIA links and stuff. Like it, it is relatively accessible. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting kind of close to time here. What I'd like to do maybe just for the next five minutes is show you how to do the multilinear narrative and then leave some time for questions. Does that sound good? Yeah? Okay. So I have one page here, but let's say I also wanted to talk about Rinmar in the spring. And I'm going to just write some text in here, add quickly a random image. I'm just going to save this. I'm just going to create a couple of different pages here so I can show you the different ways of connecting them. And then I'm going to connect, I'm going to create shocking Rimar in the winter. We'll just leave it at that. We'll leave fall off for now. Okay. And I'm just, I'm selecting the title of the website just so I can get back to this, this blank sort of front page here. And I'm going to edit here uh, because maybe this is where I want the, the users, right, when they come to my site, this is the first thing they're going to say. Um, Scalar requires that I give it a title, but it's not going to show up, but I'm going to just put it there for right now. Um, and I'm going to choose the layout that's called the book splash, which is that one you saw that's kind of the interactive thing with the title of the site. Um, they helpfully tell you here, if you read it, that the book splash layout requires a key image. Um, and so I'm going to go into, again, some of these other places for customizability and your styling. To select key image, and it just says, which of these do you want to be your key image? I don't have very exciting ones <laughs> right now. Um, and I'm also going to turn this page into what's called a path. So again, this is Scalar's way of relating different materials in a multi-linear way. So you can connect anything on a path. I'm going to, right now, I'm just going to do my three pages, the Bryn Mawr in the spring, Bryn Mawr in the summer, Bryn Mawr in the winter. And I'm going to go ahead and add those. And it's just drag and drop. They actually somehow, oh, because they're alphabetized correctly, right? So you can drag and drop if the, the seasons are out of order. It's very easy to remove or add things. Um, as you sort of build your content. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save and View. It's going to take just a moment here. So it gives us the, the kind of fancy <laughs> book splash page, right? Which she looks very severe. I like that. Um, and because I've made this a path, um, this is sort of the, the landing page. We have this button that um, says to begin, so it would say begin with whatever the name of the, the path actually was. So it says begin with Bryn Mawr in the spring. And if I select that, it takes me to the first page. It shows me very small on the top left. It says intro one of three. So the path I called intro, right? Um, it tells me there are three things on this path, and I'm at location one. Um, and then it gives me an op option to continue, which if I do, it will take me to Spring Mar in the summer, which has a different layout. Again, now it's telling me I'm at location two. If I scroll down, I can go backwards back to the spring, or I can go forwards to the winter. And so, um, again, it's kind of a different way of navigating material, and, it, and it, it doesn't have to be a page. Again, I could have the next item be a video, right? So if you want your students to be to read something and then watch a video, and you want them to have that kind of experience of moving through the site, you could absolutely do that. Um, because of the flat ontology, you could actually embed paths and paths. So they, they, it, it becomes almost like a choose your own adventure, right? So that they can choose, OK, am I going to go now into Bryn Mawr history, or am I going to go into Bryn Mawr curriculum? And then there, there can be sort of options from there, right? So um, I find this often like one of the, again, one of the harder things to wrap your head around how it might be useful. Um, but I've seen it used uh, in a lot of different ways. And the cool thing is, um, one of their early ideas with, with Scalar is that um, it shouldn't all be up to the author, right? And so they were thinking about how users encounter these materials as well. 
Um, and we're used to set up sort of the, the standard menus, right, where it's sort of, um, you know, like about the project, the homepage, et cetera. They wanted a kind of a different way for people to encounter those materials, to make choices about whether they want to leave the path or continue down the path. Um, I think that's moved a little bit more into the background in this, this latest version, um, but I think it's still, uh, I, I think it kind of underpins some of the philosophy, I would say, of, of this particular um, platform. Okay, so I'm going to just skip forward a little bit here. So, like, as, as I was saying about the paths, right, so you can have, um, you can also, you know, move backwards and forwards on a path. There's options when you get to the end of the path, where do you want people to go? Do you want them to go back to the beginning? Do you want them to start a new path? Um, there's a lot of options there. I'm going to skip tagging for the moment. Um, so the other thing that they have are these uh, built-in visualizations, so ways of um, encountering materials a little bit differently. And this is based on the relationships that you have established as an author between objects. So, um, okay. So this is using JavaScript's D3 library. Anyone sort of familiar with that? Um, and they have these as kind of, uh, right now they're not embeddable on the page, but eventually they're gonna turn them into widgets, which you can embed on the page. Um, and I realize this is really, really light, but there are actually, there's gray lines that are connecting each of these. Um, so this is actually, this is showing me all of the materials on the site, all the things that I've created today, um, the relationship between them. And so it's saying there's one path, I have three pages, I have three annotations, uh, and I can change the layout so that I can see the actual relationships between them, right? So like on this particular page, uh, or this particular, oh, and I'm sorry, you can't see this at all, can you? Let me see if I can put the lights down. Is that any better? Yeah. Yeah, not much, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so you can see the relationships that this that the our lovely lady has with different objects. So with a page, um, with actually she's on two pages, um, and, and oh, I think she has one annotation as well. Yeah. And you said that this is not embeddable and you can't navigate to this page unless you click. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's something that they're changing because um, I think they were just kind of trying it out. This is, again, this is a technology that's in, um, still in beta. And so they were trying it out. I think people liked it. So they're deciding to integrate it um, more into their materials. I find it most useful when, um, when you have lots of things <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe you've lost track of them or the students, to help the students sort of Again, understand relationships that they've set up already in a, in a more visual way. They're used to maybe creating textual um, connections through essays and so on, but this might help them uh, visualize it differently. Yeah. Was that a question? Or? Yeah. Okay. Great. So let me get back here a little bit. Okay, so um, yeah, we did that already. Okay, so um, in terms of, since we only have a few minutes left, I have a couple of links here as well. Um, so again, links to the guide, their documentation. They have a nice quick start guide, which is great, um, again, for students especially, to sort of just get them up and running. Um, it's relatively easy, as I hope you've noticed today, to just sort of get up and running with it, to put your content in it, to put your media files in it, to start building those connections between things. Um, but what I like to say about Scalar 2 is it has a lot of depth. So if you want to take it to the next level, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of options that you have to do without hosting it yourself, without, um, yeah, without getting too, too technical. There's a lot, of, a lot of customization that can happen there as well. They do free webinars. Uh, they're done for the spring. And so I don't know if they're going to have any um, this summer, but they'll certainly start back up in the fall. Uh, and then I had I had on here DH questions and answers. Has anyone used DH questions and answers? Oh well, okay. Then I feel less bad. It's a really it was a really really great resource. As of 24 minutes before I looked at this link this morning, they decided to archive them and close all comments and questions. So I was like, I'm glad I checked the link this morning. Um, but there's also if anyone uses Slack in their institution, which is a platform for communicating, it's trying to keep people off email. 
It's um, great in some ways, awful in others, who doesn't really use it. But it has a really vibrant digital humanities community, and I think that's where a lot of people are asking questions these days, um, in addition to Twitter. Um, so, so those are some great places, I would say, to, to get help if you want to sort of move to the next level with your Scalar installs. Great questions that you have, things I didn't get to. Yeah. I sort of have an impossible question, but lovely. Good, good. I thought I'd start off easy on it. Um, so if you wanted to start a scale of project at your institution, uh, more just to help educate folks on what's thinkable and possible with it, like what's the one thing you might go for? You know, the easiest, obvious. I mean, I know you have the yeah. list, it's good for blow up, blah, 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 all that stuff, but just. Yeah, I would say, um, I don't know if it's necessarily the easiest, but the one that might get the most traction is to show it used in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, if you had an example that you could build that was about, that had the syllabus and then had also students' contributions, so maybe they're working with materials that have been set up and they're creating their own pads and okay. commentary on those materials. Okay. Um, that seems to be what faculty get really excited about often. So creating kind of a book as you go, you mean about the course itself? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so it's it's again, it's like other learning management systems in that it's keeping the mate, the course materials and the learning kind of in in the same place, right? Or it could be doing that. Um, yeah, easier examples might be like find something cool and interesting in your special collections and, that you have that you want to expose, and and just do like a little, um, you know, a dozen objects, their materials, some annotations on those materials. Yeah, that might be. Easier for her. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there a scalar gallery? Um, there, it's easy. not well maintained. So actually, they have like a showcase, but there's I think there's only two examples of like non super highly customized scalar two books, mm -hmm. and they have two examples of very like twenty thousand dollar web designer right like customized ones. Um, but when you're in scalar, there actually is. So it's it's, it's kind of hidden. But let me just show you. Um, when you go to your dashboard, uh, which is the gear here, um, oh, you know what? It's in index. When you first log in, you know how we saw that kind of index of stuff? Yeah. So they've got some feature books here as well. So some of these are good. Um, this is the book supplement. Um, some of these are actually this one, unfortunately, is Scalar One. It's a cool project. That's the textbook, the archive. Yeah, we have a few other. Another pedagogy workbook. Some good examples there. And are they categorized at all? Do you know um, for like if you just want to see something that's a classroom example, like a CMS kind of thing? No, they're not. Yeah. Um, the other option, actually, Scalar has a blog where they feature some of these materials. Um, it's probably updated, you know, once or twice a semester. Um, but just on scalar.usc.edu, um, they have a blog, and yeah, so they, you know, it goes back a ways. But they have some um, examples in there as well. Um, yeah, the other thing is they're really responsive. It's a pretty small team. If you email them, like, do you have examples of people using this as a CMS? I'm sure they'll probably get back to you. That's some good ones. Yeah. Are they automatically public websites? Like, can you search them? Good question. So they are, where's the one I just created? There we are. Uh, you can set them uh, public or private. Um, under sharing on the dashboard, uh, I believe it's automatically, it looks like it's automatically private. So you have the option to make the URL public or not, um, and whether or not you want it to appear in the scalar indexes as well. Um, they have some options about like um, commenting. They also have a hypothesis sidebar for people who are interested in that. Went to the thing earlier today. Um, whether or not you want it to be duplicated, so you remember that drop down in the beginning, you can choose to have your book be duplicatable. Yeah. Say that again? Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can export the whole time, right? Yes. So, this is another really cool thing. So, um, oh, actually, 
two cool things I want to show you. So one is um, versions. So Scalar has page versions. Let me just go to an actual page. So if you scroll all the way down, it says this is version one of this page. Um, let me just see. I think the other one has two versions. And yeah, so this is version two of this page. If I, oops, sorry. If I select all versions, it shows me the other versions, and I can go back to them. So this is again great if you're like composing in here. I used to be very nervous about composing in like online um, places that I, especially beta, right, software. Um, but this is this is pretty good about keeping those versions there. Again, this is only things you've actually saved. Um, but the question was about importing and exporting, um, and you can export. So what this actually does. Um, it's not really a full export. What it's exporting is the objects, the text, and their relationships. Um, so it's not necessarily exporting like your customized style if you've done that. Um, it's only, you can export it and import it into like another scalar instance. Um, and it'll work fine there, but you couldn't like load it into WordPress site, right? Or just run it by itself. It has to be in loaded into um, a working scalar instance. Um, they also, and I tested this and it works, they actually now have a batch upload for objects too. So if you're working with your special collections and you have the, the images are already posted somewhere and you just have a spreadsheet of the image URLs and the metadata, um, it'll pull it in uh, pretty well. And yeah, they use Dublin Core. Uh, they have a couple different metadata standards which you can, you can look at right there. Another one for art. Um, yeah. Other questions? Are there any classes that you use at Brinmark? At Brinmark? So we, um, I'm brand new <laughs> as of last July. So um, we just now are piloting a domain of one's own as of like three weeks ago. And so in the fall, we're hoping to now offer, we didn't have a way of really offering Scalar um, locally other than the hosted version. Um, so, like I said, I've been working more actually with our special collections and their students. So we have a museum studies program here as well. Um, and actually, I, that's not true. We have a uh, we have a class this semester that used Scalar um, for they did a curated exhibition on the self uh, and mirrors, um, and we had an archaeology undergraduate class use it last semester as well. So that was a, a professor who was looking to move away from Omeka who didn't like the kind of clunkiness of Omeka and the look of it. Um, and wanted her students to be able to do something that's more visually interesting. So we use Scalar for that. And in that case, um, if you're using it in the classroom, there's always two options. So one would be the professor creates the book and invites the students to participate. Um, but again, there's not great granular permissions for that. So like the whole site is either private or public, right? Um, everyone's either an author or they're not. Um, or what more people have done is uh, the students each create their own scalar books and then make sure the professor has access to it so then they can decide if it's private or public, um, they can delete it later, things like that. They have more, um, um, they can customize it more, things like that. Other questions? Great. I think we are at well, we're a few minutes early, but that's okay. Um, I'll stick around if you if you do. Oh, do you have one? So, what yeah. domain of one's own is scalar? I mean, what you're thinking there? You're gonna... Yeah. So they actually offer it. Um, so does everyone know domain of one's own? A little bit, sort of like it's a reclaim hosting is the vendor. They came out of University of Mary Washington, um, and it's just a kind of way of providing students, in our case, also faculty and staff. Um, uh, a space online to install their own applications, and it comes with Installatron, so it's sort of like pretty much one click install of WordPress or um, a number of different things. Um, and some of that, because it's reclaim hosting, they have an educational mission. They also include Omeka, Scalar, Mukutu, which is Drupal based, and, and a couple other things. So, um, so yeah, so we're hoping that the for classes, so, so again, using the two options, so some faculty might choose to create their own Scalar book which they invite students to, or students can create it in their own domain space as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And the idea is they can take it with them when they go, right? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming. And like I said, I'll stick around if you have uh, individual questions.